Thank you very much, Lily, for that kind introduction. It's so wonderful to be here with you all today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and I first just want to back up and say that I know that many people that are viewing this presentation today have a, a deep knowledge of Chinese culture and history, um, but there might be a few that don't. And so I hope that those that do will bear with me when I say that of course, China, a place of continuous civilization for thousands of years, a place of incredible works of art of all different types of media, a place that has influenced not only its neighbors in terms of the art and culture, but also has influenced uh, the greater world. Uh, so an incredible place, and we are going to be focusing on ceramics today, particularly porcelain from the Qing dynasty. Uh, however, I do want to add that uh, there has been amazing moments of porcelain production in, and ceramic production in China throughout the history of China. So we are focusing on this one moment, but please, I know and understand that there are some amazing other moments in the history of Chinese uh, porcelain and ceramic production. So the Qing dynasty, as many of you know, was a dynasty that started in the 1600s and ended around 1912. Uh, let's continue. And just to set the stage a little to understand uh, what was happening in the Qing dynasty, uh, the rulers of the Qing dynasty came um, from outside of China. They came uh, from the Northeast, as you can see here. And uh, the previous dynasty, the Ming dynasty was an, another amazing moment for the production of uh, ceramics and porcelain. Uh, but towards the end of that dynasty, there were uh, some issues that allowed an opening for the people of, of this area to come in and take over China. And that's what occurred. And they created a new dynasty, the Qing dynasty. And again, I know there are many people here that know and understand that, but for those that may, might not be aware, what you're seeing here is a map of China and you're actually seeing the outer limits of what the Ch Qing dynasty will take over. Uh, so this was a moment of incredible stability. Once uh, the Qing dynasty had, uh, had settled the area, uh, a moment of incredible stability. And when we have that, uh, we are going to see amazing things happen in art. And one of the, our inquiries when we're looking at works of art, I think, should be, why does this work of art look the way it does? And when we ask that question, one of the answers, the first answer is going to be, what's going on in the world around the artist? What's the historical context? And here we have a moment of incredible stability uh, that helps create some interesting uh, porcelains in, um, in China. So Qing means pure. We are going to be focusing on the reign of three emperors during this dynasty. Uh, and during the reign of these particular emperors, uh, that's a reign of a total of about 130 years. So again, that stability is going to make the production of incredible ceramics possible. And again, we're going to begin, we are only going to be focusing on porcelain production. There were many other types of bodies of ceramics being made during this time period, uh, earthenware, stoneware, but we're going to focus on porcelain. And of course, porcelain is a almost a glass-like type of ceramic that's made from a substance, kaolin, which China had an amazing amount of incredible material to use for porcelain, um, which when it's fired, it is, can be very thin, it's very beautiful and you can actually hit it with your finger and it'll make a ring. So that is the, the type of ceramic we're gonna be focusing on today. Again, when we ask that question, why does the work of art look the way it does? We really wanna know who's paying, who is the patron? And so during this time, we have three rulers that are very interested in the production of ceramics that they actually take a personal interest in the way the ceramics look. So those rulers and their tastes matter when it comes to the way uh, these ceramics were produced. The Kangxi ruler who ruled for over 60 years, again, a time of incredible stability, who uh, did a, a many amazing things um, for the, the country of China, but who would had a personal interest in ceramic production and we'll be looking a little bit more at, at what he did during this time period. But one of the things he does do is during the end of the prior reign, the imperial kilns had been partially destroyed and he makes it a priority to rebuild those uh, kilns and also 
kind of revitalize the administration of those kilns. And so for that, uh, we get an incredible uh, range of production that comes from his, his rule. He was, this is one work of many that were produced during that time period, and we're gonna discuss that later. But as you can see here, he was not uh, afraid to uh, think about color, even if that the, the sources of those colors came from outside of China, which uh, some of them did at the, at, during his rule. Of course, over time, uh, the artisans in China will learn how to make some of these colors that initially had come from outside China. Uh, but when he was in, in power, we see some of some early pigments coming from outside China, which we'll discuss in a minute. The, the next ruler we're going to be looking at, a ruler who uh, was, he ruled for a shorter time than the, the, the other two, but he was so interested in uh, ceramics of the past and he was a scholar. And so we see during his time frame a kind of revitalization, a looking back to the ceramics of, of earlier times. And uh, so some of that production is quite amazing. Is this the only time in the history of Chinese ceramics or porcelains that there's a looking back to the past? Well, no, it's not. Uh, and we're gonna, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute or two, but he was really interested and ordered quite a few um, productions of uh, works of art that reflected earlier time periods, especially time periods uh, like the Song Dynasty, about 1000 CE. So a time period of incredible, beautiful ceramics that he uh, uses as inspiration for the works that are produced during his reign. And then finally, the Qianlong uh, ruler who uh, rules again for a very long time and he, he is also very interested in the production of ceramics. And when you have rulers that are actually personally involved and thinking about how those ceramics are gonna be produced, you will see some incredible things happen. Um, and in particular, in the middle of his reign, we see some amazing works of art uh, occur. This is an example, and we'll be discussing this a little bit later. So what you're looking at here is actually uh, uh, the ghost market or the shard market that you can go um, go to the southern part of China today, uh, where uh, porcelains are still being produced in uh, Jin De Jin, and uh, you can go there and you can actually purchase uh, shards um, like this. But there were a few things that happened in the Qing Dynasty that allowed, uh, first of all, allowed artisans more time to hone their craft. And additionally, besides that, also um, there were changes that affected the power and the funds that were being given to the imperial kilns. And one of those changes was that we see that the Qing Dynasty rulers end the hereditary artisan conscription. And this was prior to this time period, uh, artisans and others would be, uh, kind of brought into forced labor basically to uh, provide labor for certain projects uh, that were important to the, the previous emperors. Uh, this was ended during the Qing dynasty time period. And because of that, artisans were then able to uh, have more time to hone their craft. Additionally, the, during the Qing dynasty, we see an end to the, require, the requirement of landless craftsmen to hand over grain as tax. And in fact, in fact, uh, folks were, who owned land were taxed, but those who were landless uh, were not any longer required to hand over grain. And of course you can understand that when you have no land and, and you're an artisan, artisan, that would have taken a lot of time to make that happen in the past. So this freed artisans and craftsmen uh, to uh, have more time to be creative and innovative in, in their uh, ceramic craft. Additionally, uh, a really important thing that happens during this time period is we see that uh, high ranking government officials are appointed to supervise the imperial kilns. And uh, this, there had been of course, people from the court supervising the kilns in the past, but these high ranking officials have a lot more, uh, have a lot more power in the court and also are able to uh, advocate for funds coming to the imperial kiln. So that, 
that causes a lot of stability in the production as well. And then finally, uh, official kilns start to collaborate. And this wasn't the first time that official kilns had collaborated with private kilns, but we see more of that happening uh, during this time period. And what would happen, of course, and I'll back up and say, for those of you who are interested, uh, there were imperial kilns, kilns that were uh, existed to provide uh, porcelain and other ceramics to the imperial court. And then there were private kilns that made works of art for uh, private individuals and also for export. Uh, during this time period, the Qing dynasty, we see a uh, coll more collaboration between the official kilns and the private kilns. For instance, if the official kilns have a large production order that they can't handle, they'd ask, uh, they would have help from the private kilns. And what happens because of this is we see an elevation of, of the, the quality of the works generally during this time period. So one more thing before we look at art, and then I am going to be feeding your eyes because really the more of these works of art you see, the more that we, you know, excited you will get, I'm sure, about this amazing moment uh, in ceramic production. Uh, but I wanted to just talk a minute about tradition and innovation. And again, this is something that many people who study the art and culture of China understand and know. So I'm really speaking to those who might are, are just learning and just starting to learn about this area. So there is in generally in China, a reverence for the past, a reverence for tradition. And that isn't uh, something like, oh, we do it this way because it's always been done this way, but instead a reverence for the, the culture of the past, for the ancestors, uh, and that is very important. And we see that happening in the ceramic production of the Qing dynasty. Of course, we see this in the ceramic production of other dynasties as well. Uh, but on the same, I, in the same time, I want us to really think about the fact that the history of Chinese uh, ceramic production is filled with innovation. It is incredible. We can go through all these different moments in the history of uh, Chinese ceramic production and see these incredible innovations. So this, this kind of, this reverence for tradition, but also innovation in ceramic production is something that is always occurring in each uh, time period. And of course is very prevalent in the Qing dynasty as well. I already kind of let you know that uh, the imperial kilns were uh, situated in the South of China. And this is an area that is today still producing porcelains, uh, but an important place because it had the resources, it had the proper clay, it had the, the wood that needed to be burned for the kilns, it had the resources, and so it was a, the perfect place for the production of porcelain. I also tell you that we aren't, there are many other places in China that were making ceramics and porcelain during this time period but we are going to be focusing on the production of this particular place. So let's get started. We are going to be looking at three types of decoration uh, that occurred in the Qing dynasty. Um, and these are actually decoration that occurred in other dynasties as well. Uh, we'll be looking at monochromatic works. We'll be looking at underglaze works, and then we'll also be looking at polychrome works. And, for the most part, there are three methods for putting the glaze on a, uh, uh, on a porcelain uh, when it is a monochromatic work, and that is by dipping, brushing, and sometimes by blowing. And so I'll back up and say that we have porcelain. Porcelain is fired at a high temperature. It's, uh, you can just fire it and you'll be able to put liquids in it and it will keep them in just fine. But there is also a glaze and a glaze can be as simple as just a clear glaze that just produces a shine or the glaze can be decorative as we'll see here with different colors. Uh, so that glaze is really what we're going to be talking about today. And what I'm gonna be showing you now are a variety of works that are basically one color, so monochromatic and different glazes that were being used uh, in the Qing dynasty. And there were so many and I'm only going to be showing you a few. Uh, so this is an area that if you're interested is something that I, you know, I urge you to spend some time uh, delving into this area. If you, if you like what you see here, 
uh, you will be amazed at the, the, so, the variety of monochromatic glazes that were made during this time period. But this is one uh, oxblood glaze. Uh, and these red glazes had been produced about 200 years earlier, but had been set aside because they were very difficult to achieve the correct color in the firing process. Um, the oxblood glaze was a very thin glaze. Uh, so when it was put on, it would kind of drip and run. And that's why often you see at the, the edges of the top, it being very thin, you can often see the, the body underneath and it often can be very thick at the bottom. This is another type of red glaze. Um, this particular jar would have been used by the emperors in rituals. Um, this particular one, because it's red, would have been used uh, for uh, at the altar of the sun. But what you're seeing here is a matte finish, a kind of all over evenness, which is very different than the glaze we saw before. And it is in the shape of a ritual vessel that might have occurred earlier in the history of China. And we're going to see that over and over again. We are going to see a looking back in the terms of the form, in terms of the forms of the ceramics. And this is something that again, doesn't just happen in the Qing dynasty. This is a beautiful peach bloom glaze. And um, this is actually a very small vase and it would have been made in a set of uh, several vases that would have been often given as gifts uh, for a scholar's tab table. And, uh, we'll just say that those of you who are, are students of the history of China understand that scholarship is very important uh, in China and in order to become a government, government official in many of these dynasties, you had to take exams. Uh, so these would have been given as gifts. This is incredible uh, glaze. It's very, very difficult to achieve this color. Uh, there were many names for it, drunken, not, not drunken beauty, drunken beauty or baby face. And I'm not gonna go too much more into this because our next speaker has some lovely, um, lovely uh, examples of this and can talk more to this particular place. So I'm gonna let him do that because it's incredible. You'll be so amazed to see the things that he has to show you. <clears throat> now, this is an incredible, I just, I look at this and I just get so excited because uh, this particular vessel now this vessel was made during the reign of that second emperor that we're discussing, who was that scholar who was really interested in the works of the past, the works of previous um, dynasties, especially the Song dynasty, uh, a period from, as you can see, uh, 960 to 1279. And that, uh, that time period was a time period of incredible, amazing uh, vessels. And so this particular um, ruler in the Qing dynasty was very interested in that and ordered many different productions of uh, vessels from uh, earlier time periods, especially the Song. And this is an example. The shape itself is incredible and is, is again from earlier time periods, but this flambe glaze is several, two glazes that are put on and then during the firing, they mix together. And so that's what you're seeing here. There's a third glaze that seems to have been applied as well, perhaps either as a re with a resist on the bottom, as you can see that that clear glaze is kind of not all the way down, uh, but maybe perhaps dipped. And then finally, look at the foot ring. It is amazing. I mean, it's a very solid foot ring for this vessel. So this is an example of what we see during that time frame. He also as I said, very interested in the history of China and in the history of, of ceramic production in China and also ordered uh, vessels like this, which was, it has a black glaze with a brown glaze kind of splattered on it and is made to look like a ritual vessel from a previous time period. So they're ritual vessels made of bronze uh, that were in different time periods in China, but I'm thinking specifically perhaps of the Shang dynasty, which uh, was about 1200 BCE, uh, where these vessels would be used in rituals and then perhaps buried in the tomb of an important person. This is a, a lovely shape. I mean, the shape is like amazing. And this is an amber glaze. And what it has here is secret decoration. So secret decoration, a decoration that is uh, inscribed onto the vessel and really you can't see it unless you're very close. So this becomes a, a, a really 
interesting moment when you're viewing the vessel, you kind of just become one really with the vessel. And I've, uh, I've uh, given you an example of what this looks like if you do get very close and look at these beautiful cloud forms, the cranes uh, and so on, very lovely. And again, I'm just feeding your eyes. I'm, I'm hope I'm wetting your, wetting your appetite uh, so that you'll be interested and want to uh, engage further with these works of art on your own. Uh, this again, the shape here is amazing. It is absolutely a shape that that comes down through the history of uh, ceramic production in China. Uh, so the shape by itself is just stunning. Uh, but this uh, glaze is very interesting. Um, it is a, uh, a robin's egg glaze and, and it would have had a, a, a dark blue put on first and then a lower and a lower fired, fired temperature, there would have been this uh, turquoise uh, that would have been sprayed on what you're seeing here. Sometimes things were sprayed on through a um, kind of a, a bamboo straw with silk over it. Uh, so that's one way that that can occur. This is incredibly rare. And so just to be able to see this, it's, it's a moment, we're having a moment right now. Uh, it's a version of the Robin's Egg Glaze, uh, but here you can see uh, it's called the Peacock Glaze. Of these uh, kind of moonlight glazes that were made different colors this particular one is in the shape of, again, a, a vessel that comes from an earlier period, the Shang Dynasty, and I'll actually show you uh, a kind of a, one of those vessels that this is inspired by. And um, this particular hue is called the sky after the rain, which is just lovely, really lovely. Uh, but this is what I'm talking about. So here's a ritual uh, vessel, a goo from the 12th century BCE. And this shape uh, was revered in the history of uh, ceramic production generally in China and specifically in porcelain production in the Qing dynasty. And now you can see where that inspiration comes from. Oh, I just, I'll just ask you to remember this decoration here because we're going to see another vessel in just a minute uh, that reflects this de decoration on it. This is also an amazing uh, shape, but also this beautiful color, tea dust uh, green glaze, uh, which reminds one of uh, tea leaves that have been ground up and with variations in, um, in firing and also in what's put into this glaze, the color can be changed. Uh, this is what I wanted you to think of, you know, this is what I'm thinking about when I asked you to remember the decoration from that Shung dynasty uh, ritual vessel, because here you're seeing a work of art that absolutely reflects uh, the past in terms of its shape uh, to remind us of ritual vessels and with a turquoise glaze, but also this lovely decoration, which absolutely is a, you know, a reverence for the past. So incredible, just incredible vessel. So we have discussed mon uh, monochromatic glazes, and now we're going to talk about underglazing. And uh, I, I know that most of us, when th those of us who think about Chinese porcelain, we may think about blue and white porcelain as we see here. And this is what we are going to be discussing quickly next. And so what this is, is a type of production where uh, you put the color on prior to the high firing of the vessel. And so there are only two, two colors in the time that we're talking about in this time period that could be used in underglaze production, and that was blue and red. And if you, if, if you have an example where the red looks really red because it's very hard to, to actually achieve, uh, that is a celebration, that's a victory. Uh, so let's just uh, look at a few examples. So this, of course, blue and white uh, underglaze pottery or ceramics or porcelain was made, you know, for several hundred years in China prior to the Qing dynasty. And there are some amazing examples in the Ming dynasty. And, uh, but what we see, especially uh, in the early part of the, the Qing dynasty, we see these examples where the artists have, are starting to use the blue, they're using a cobalt blue in a way where they have several 
um, kind of washes several tones or colors of blue, so light to dark, right? And sometimes these particular vessels are called, you know, five color, five color um, underglaze vessel. So this, this is a, a lovely example. And let's get a little closer. Because I think when we get closer, what you can see, of course, is the variety in the blue tones. So you have the very, very dark tones here to the very almost white tones here. Uh, and that is uh, kind of reflecting what's happening in the ink painting uh, as well. So we're, we're getting kind of, and this is again, not unusual to see uh, things that are happening in other, other media uh, being reflected in ceramic production in China. But notice, I think this is nice to be able to just see the variety of uh, colors here, those five colors that create a, a beautiful, uh, just a beautiful moment in this porcelain vase. And of course, we have our scholars here in the landscape, the landscape so much bigger than the scholars, um, but they are present, we are there, but land, the nature is so, you know, beautiful and big and overwhelming. So a lovely example of what was it happening, especially in the Kangxi time period. This is a great uh, vessel because it actually documents a certain moment in history. So the story is that a, an important official comes to the kilns in the south of uh, China, the imperial kilns, and a, a number of scholars and uh, meet with him and they have a day and they, they're sharing their poetry with each other. And one of those scholars was also a potter who could um, actually paint this. And so he made this as an, a, a memory of that time period. And so what you see here, of course, is uh, again, those, those different gradations of tone, those different washes that were so wonderful in this time period, but also you're seeing the calligraphy. And of course, this is something that happens in painting as well, where we have the image and calligraphy. Calligraphy, of, as you know, a very, very important, very high art form in China. And so this is just kind of amazing to be able to see that not only this moment documented, but also the poetry and the image together. Uh, just wanted to show you this flask, just another example of the blue underglaze. And notice again, the variety in tones here. This shape, the Pilgrim's Flask, again, a looking back, uh, actually back to the Silk Roads, uh, which of course are a past, a uh, connection of past that connected China to the West, uh, where trade of uh, objects and also ideas occurred. Um, and on the Silk Road, folks would carry these Pilgrim Flasks that were often made of animal skin, with water and other other liquids, other beverages. And so we start to see this shape very early. Actually, we see it sometimes in bronzes that are buried with folks earlier in time. And we continue to see this shape as we move through the history of Chinese ceramics. Um, and here you're seeing a lovely example here with pomegranates, a symbol of fertility and good fortune. And not just in China, but also in the Near East. And we know that there were many, uh, many, uh, folks in the Near East that just revered the blue and white uh, porcelain of China. And they were folks who actually um, would engage in trade with China for these objects. So now we're seeing an incredible moment because we are seeing that red underglaze, uh, a successful red underglaze uh, that of course this, as, as I said, this color would have been fired at that high temperature and it's beautiful. This is a beautiful shape again, but also notice just the decoration. We have a dragon here. He has four claws. If he had five, we would know that was an imperial dragon. But notice the cloud forms and of course this beautiful repetition here, lovely energy here. But this is amazing in itself because of this beautiful red color. Another example that you can go and see at the San Diego Museum of Art, um, a lovely shape by itself. But again, this lovely red underglaze, a successful underglaze. This ring you're seeing is a kind of an innovation by the people, the folks at the museum to, to keep this vessel in place if something uh, should occur like an earthquake. But look how lovely this is. And when we have just a little bit of decoration, we really can admire the shape of the vessel. Okay. So we're on our last part and we are going to be looking at polychrome overglaze and this, of course, many colored glaze. And this 
would have been, uh, most often these objects were fired with a glaze on it, either clear glaze or white glaze. And then uh, enamels were put on top. Enamels are usually a mixture of pigment and a flux, usually a glass flux. A flux allows uh, the, the material to adhere to the vessel and also reduces the temp temperature for that to happen. So these enamels would, could not have survived a high temperature firing. So often the porcelain, always the porcelain was fired first. And occasionally these enamels were put just on the porcelain without any glaze as well. There were a number of, a, a number, a, a vast number of um, overglaze, uh, polychrome, polychrome overglaze um, uh, decorations that occurred in the Qing Dynasty. And we're not going to be looking at all of them today. Uh, that would take quite some time. I'd be happy to do that, but I know you have the rest of your day you wanted to get to. Um, so we are going to just look at a couple of moments in this polychrome decoration. And we're first going to look at what the West describes as Fami Vert, uh, which is a green family. And, um, and often has been called five color wear. And again, another uh, designation for it is hard colors. And this five color wear was happening prior to the Qing Dynasty. So in the Ming Dynasty, you had wares like this. And by the way, five color wares, and we might want to consider it more multicolor wares, not necessarily five specific colors. Um, and, but we see innovations in this uh, type of wear in uh, the early Qing Dynasty during the Kangxi reign. Um, this really is most prevalent during that time period. And it's called Femi Vert in the West because of predominance of green. These wares were interesting in that uh, they often depicted uh, things that were happening in the world around the artist. So they depicted uh, fiction, they depicted um, uh, plays, they depicted festivals and things like that. So those are things that often the subject matter of these, these works. They're called hard colors and I'll show you uh, why in a second, but they are called hard colors because after the firing, uh, many parts of these uh, decoration felt like they were very solid. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a second. And we just looked at this, but this of course is a, the Dragon Boat Festival, which is celebrated. Um, and so this is a celebration that's being depicted and let's look, look at it just a little closer so I can explain to you why it's called hard colors. And what you're seeing here, uh, by the way, some, one of the innovations, there's innovation in the color green during this time period, but also uh, these colors uh, are now, you can actually paint them on at different uh, strengths in a way. And so you can have a variety in tone, but look at here, just look how, um, how uh, hard, strong these colors are, these, these kind of solidness about the, the color here, for instance, uh, you do have lighter colors, but we're not seeing brush strokes here. So there's kind of a, a kind of a, yeah, I don't know, really know how to describe it at this moment, uh, but it's a solidness that we see in this, that um, that we will see, diff see different things happening in the other type of decoration that we're going to explore, the later type of decoration called uh, Femi Rose. Um, and often I think that designation of hard colors is something that is just a way to differentiate uh, the technique a little bit between these two types. It's really beautiful, by the way, amazing. This is an amazing depiction on this vessel. Uh, beautiful colors here. And I think here we get a better understanding of what is meant by hard color. So the solidness to these shapes, there is a, a kind of, a, the edges are hard. Um, and occasionally you see a little bit of a variation in tone, but for the most part, a solidness to the colors. And when we start to look at the next type, you'll see that uh, things change a bit. Beautiful, just, just another very beautiful vase uh, depicting a historical warriors. So this is very typical of the subject matter of these types of vessels. This is a depiction of a play. So uh, actors engaged in a play uh, very much, again, the subject matter you would expect from these, uh, these hard color or uh, five color wares. So 
the the other type and then we're we're going to be finishing up i i i wish i could talk to you forever about this uh, because it's just such an, a fascinating area but the other type that i wanted to present to you today was fami rose which is the western designation uh, for what was also known as powdered colors and foreign colors and uh, this is a type of overglaze production again remember these porcelains would have been fired at a high temperature most often. They would have had a, a glaze also fired on them, a, a white glaze or a, a clear glaze fired. And then these enamel colors would have been painted on and then uh, fired at a lower temperature. And when these first begin, this kind of pink color that you're seeing here uh, was really coming from, uh, from the West. And so that might be why we often see the designation foreign colors coming from the West. Now, this isn't going to continue. What we are going to see, as I've already told you, are Chinese craftsmen who are going to, uh, going to make, uh, discover their own versions of these colors, and then they will use those uh, in these works of art. Uh, but these Femi Rose uh, works of art really start to be favored in the rain of that second emperor that we were discussing. Then we see those green, greener uh, colors that we saw before, the hard colors or the, the five color wear, the Femi Vert. Uh, there's some is still being produced there, but not uh, to the extent that they had been produced prior. And this is a lovely saucer that gives a really nice example of what we're talking about because most of these would be made with the shape being outlined and then a white enamel being put on, on, the, on the shape, and then these colored enamels being placed on top. And what would ha happen is sometimes you would see almost a powdery effect, which is why sometimes they are designated as pow powdered colors. And you can see that here. Uh, but if we look down here, and we'll, we'll start to see up here as well, look at the variety in tone. So these are washes. And sometimes in some of these works, we can even see the brushwork of the artist. So really beautiful, almost like a watercolor effect on these incredible ceramics. Uh, this is another example. And uh, what we start to see uh, at the beginning of this, we see quite a bit of uh, just flowers and things by themselves. And eventually what we start to see are bird and flower arrangements which of course is a, a popular subject in painting as well. So we can see again that the culture um, in other, the, the media in other media is being reflected in uh, these ceramics. So this is a very fine example. And you can kind of almost see that power uh, effect there. And another, I just, I wanna just feed your eyes just for a couple minutes and then we'll be almost done. Uh, but here, this is a nice example because you can see uh, just the, the change in, in, in lights to darks here. Uh, and you can also see that in the other colors as well. This is really a lovely play to lotus, a lotus pond with a pair of mandarin ducks, right? Symbolizing marital happiness. And we just saw this, but this is an excellent example. I mean, this is like a beautiful example. And um, I, I think it's a nice opportunity to see that beautiful, uh, just the way that these colors have been painted onto the vessel and the shading here and the change in color, just lovely, just a lovely example. The shape is incredible too, by the way, uh, an incredible shape. When we get to the later part of, part, the later part of the Tianlong reign, so that's that third emperor that we've been discussing, we see a lot of things happening in terms of this, the porcelain production. And there's a combination of uh, many different ideas that are happening uh, during this time period. And this is an example that, that, that are several, there are several ideas happening here, right? So first we have um, the shape of this vessel, which is reminiscent of, again, of a bronze from a much earlier time period with these handles. And then we have the celadon color. And celadon, of course, that's a, a name applied to this color uh, from the West. Uh, this kind of blue green color, but this color uh, ware had been made for centuries in, for many, many centuries in uh, China and has been revered because of the color 
and its association with jade. And jade is a very important substance in China, as, as most of you know. Uh, and it is a very hard substance that also it can be a metaphor for strength, strength of character. And uh, this color is revered not only in China, but in other cultures as well. I'm thinking of Korea and in other places. So we have that going on. And then we finally have this overglaze um, depiction of a landscape, uh, which is actually quite beautiful with, uh, we have calligraphy here as well. So quite a bit going on here, which was not unusual for this time period. And then finally, I have two more vessels I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to wrap up. And this is uh, in a private collection. It was sold within the last year. It's about as big, it can fit in my hand. It's very small. Um, and this work of art brings up another issue, another idea that we need to know about. And that is that although met much, there was an imperial kiln in the south of China, um, there, were, there was also in the Forbidden City a workshop for the painting of vessels like this. So often, especially now, this is from the Kangxi time period, uh, vessels would be produced, the, the, the body would be produced um, in, in the imperial kilns in the south. And then small amounts of those bodies would be brought up to this uh, workshop and they would be painted in this workshop. And these works would be specifically for the emperor and his family. And they're extremely rare. Uh, they are very rare. And what we're getting here is an example of one of those works where you have a kind of a thickly applied enamel here. This, this background has been analyzed and it partially is made of ruby glass. Um, and so this thickly applied enamel that we see here is often associated with that idea of foreign colors that I discussed before. And we know that early on some of the pink colors, as I said, came from outside of China. Um, so this is an unusual, very rare uh, example. And it has lotus, the lotus on this. And we know that the Kangxi uh, ruler was very much enamored by lotuses. He was somebody who thought himself a scholar. Lotus can be, uh, is of course in Buddhism and is a symbol of purity, but is also a symbol of a, a fine gentleman in China as well. And we know that the Kangxi emperor would get up their stories to get up at four in the morning to practice his calligraphy and painting. And so um, this particular vessel is very, very special and very unusual. And then the final vessel that I wanna show you today uh, comes a little bit later in the next rule, the next reign. And this again is in a private collection. And I think it is a beautiful example of what we've been trying to talk about when we talk about those powdered colors. So let me give you a, a just a close up for a minute and then I'm going to, um, to wrap this up and say thank you to you. But now you can see this beautiful uh, brushwork, the beautiful shifts in tone and color that come uh, from that, that uh, Femi rose, that kind of a powdered color application uh, that you're seeing here. And then you also notice, of course, there's kind of a shift in technique when we're looking at these birds. So just a beautiful, incredible example of what was uh, being able to be made in uh, the kilns and in uh, the workshops during the Qing dynasty. So I, I just wanna thank you so much for your time and attention. And I hope this is what your appetite and I hope that you will, uh, will you know, take some time when you have some time in your life and do some investigation and find the works of art, uh, the ceramics or porcelain that you prefer uh, that were made not only in the Qing dynasty, but perhaps uh, in other time periods in China as well. Because I promise you one thing though, once you go down this road, you will not want to stop. So don't say I didn't warn you. And thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you so much, Ali, for your wonderful presentation. We can see that you are passionate, so passionate about porcelain in China. And I agree with you totally. Not only have you uh, whetted our appetite, but it is a road of no return. You will continue. So the next person who has 
gone on this road and is not going to return anywhere soon is Mr. Andy Liu. Andy started collecting porcelain a long time ago. Today, he's going to share with you his private collections and mostly focusing on the color red, the mystery of making China color red. So if you can join me and a hundred people here to welcome Mr. Andy Liu. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> First of all, and uh, thank you for the Ali's uh, presentation. And you see a lot of beautiful Qing dynasties porcelain. Today, I'm going to share with you guys is my collection, the Kangxi Peach Bone Porcelain. And this particular one, the different, this, this kind of red is have a little green in there. So it's very hard to achieve there. The color for this kind of color, uh, Peach Bone, is uh, between the 1250 and the 1280 alpha. The, 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 so the success rate only 3%. That's why, you know, the only country time have these kinds of color. Look at this face and uh, we have to introduce a little bit about the country. You know, the, this dragon is very ferocity, you know, and because Kangxi, he was, uh, his father died, got mystery, you know. One says died in the missile, you know, in the pandemic. The another one, he says that he went to the temple, become a monk. But he don't like the politics. It's two stories. I don't know which one is right, you know. Anyway, Kangxi was eight years to become a king. They're like the kitty king, you know. And his mother is behind him to help him. So in that time, he really had a lot of hard time. A lot of the big shot in the, in the government trying to take over, take over him and overpower him. Until 14, he really become a king. He can independent without his mother. Then, you know, the, he eliminated uh, the, the people against him, like, you know, the Alpai, his people. Then he had a very good relationship with the military. And he's a very brief uh, king and uh, very aggressive. So every battlefield, he's on front. So when he was 24 years old, he had the last fight called Chen Ge Zhan. You know, that means uh, he, he beat the big uh, inventor from the north, north side. After that, he take over Tibet, also take over the Mongolia. So in his he in that dynasty, his territory probably one of the largest in Chinese history. Okay, let's go to the next. This one, we got a close look. You can see he's very ambitious and very, I call it cocky. Look at his uh, crown, the dragon's crown, the holy pearl. Usually, I never see the dragon holy pearl already. Usually, he's chasing the pearl. This one means He's in control. The country is in his hand, and he's in his control. And I guess this one probably is uh, achieving the country 30 years, something like that. Because before the 40, country 40 years, he don't want, want any mark under the knees. Because he's thinking it's a bad luck. If you broke in the porcelain, that means his name is going to copy him, right? So he don't want to do that. So after 40s, he got a 
mature, much mature king. And he's thinking, you know, it's okay. So he started putting his name underneath. He's like, Da Qing Kang Xi Nian Zi, you know, these kinds of things. So I guess this one, this one don't have the, his uh, uh, name on it, but you have a special mark for this vase. And this vase is very, this mark is very unique. And uh, I cannot show you because I'm uh, afraid somebody saw it when you forged the, the mark. Let's go to the next. Uh, you know, the, in Kangxi time, the dragon is so powerful. Same thing, you know, in, the, in our history, every kind of dynasty, when they start, the dragon always like that. Like a Yuan Dynasty or in the Ming Dynasty. Ming Dynasty, the, you know, the, the, the Yuan Dynasty, the, the, drag, the dragon is very, very tough, only three claws. The, the hair is small and like a, like, a, like a snake, you know, because the neck is very, very thin. And you go to the Xuan De time, the same thing. The dragon is always very powerful. But when the Later dynasty, the dragon is very soft, you know. That means, you know, the time that the, the, the emperor is different, you know. And so you can show on there these dynasty's uh, products. Let's go next. Okay, see so this dragon is chasing the pearl, you know. He tried to pick the pearl. And the uh, Kangxi time, that, that one, he already got a pearl in his head. And also I want to, so by the way, say the Chinese always like a dragon. What's a dragon? Why the Chinese like the dragon? Because thousands and thousands of years ago, the China is a Teuton society. There are so many tribes have their own symbol. Some is a bird, some is a snake, some is a gold. And some of the ox, you know, all kinds of stuff. But one is the, we call the yellow king. He's a symbol, he's a, the flag is yellow. And he's the one developed the campus. That's why he conquered uh, all the tribe. You know, when you go to the battlefield, the campus is very important. You know where you go, where you at, you know. After they conquered all the tribe, Formed the Zhongguo, the China. So he's a very fair. He just said, okay, we take a, a little part of every tribe. And he said, then the horses face, and goats, goatees, and uh, deer's horn, and uh, fish shell, and the snake's body, and the hawk's claw. And he put his color on as yellow. That's where the dragon come from. That's why the dragon shine the symbol to unite the Chinese. Okay, let's go next. Okay, this is a big fish plate. This is what the, the regular people use it. And you know, the, the Chinese people like a red. So today I'm talking about the red. So this is a red fish and uh, pretty good, you know. Let's see the next one. <clears throat> see, this one is same film, same fish, same time, come to the same time. See, this one, the all red is gone. You only see a little light green. And uh, that's why the red is hard to achieve. In the all kinds of color, red is the hardest one. Let's see the next one. See, this is the tail. Still have a little red in there. You know, just the fire is, is too high. So the red color is gone. They call the, the terminology says uh, the color is uh, flies, fly away. You know, okay, let's go next. Well, this is the same same period you can see. Same thing is a uh, peach bloom. And this one is just like a 
we saw before, you know, I'll issue some picture down the study room and put on the tables. Always about eight pieces. Very small, it's not big. And I saw this one in the Metropolitan Museum. They have a complete eight pieces. This place, we can, we can tell from the, the previous the, the fish play. See, this is the, the, the temperature is too high. That's why the red is gone. Show the green, so many greens come out. You know. And let's see the next one. Because this one is an uh, ink pot. See, this one is better than the other one, but still the temperature is not achieved the, 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 the right temperature. So the red is still too dark, you know, and it's still a little, little bit higher than can show the, that's a pitch brown color. But this one is better than the other one. At least it's still even. The color still even. Okay, let's go next. Okay, this is the one who got a mark. So this is after Kang Xi 40, 40 years old, he allowed to put his name underneath. No. Okay, let's go to the next. Okay, because we talk about the place today, no, and uh, as you know, the most famous glaze is in Chinese history, is in Song Dynasty. In Song Dynasty, the, the so, so many kilns, and the only they say that these five kilns is the uh, most famous one. The first one is called Ru, the second one is called Guan, the third one is called Ge, the fourth one is called Jun, the last one is called Ding. And the rule, for we understand, there's only about the 280 pieces that exist. Just most of them are in the museums. They're in the British Museum, and the Gubong in Taiwan, the Gubong in Taipei. And also, you know, the, I'm talking about you know, the, the, the clay. And you know, the Chinese, you know, the, the secret formula for hundreds, thousands of years. They don't know how they can achieve these things, the China, for China. Finally, you know, in the late Qing Dynasty, German figured out it because the clay is a different clay. We call it Kaolin. After that, the first kiln they, they, they made is in the German, they call it Meissen, famous Meissen porcelain. You know, and uh, Today, the Song Dynasty is so famous, so today, still there are so many last, last people still try to imitate their, their, their porcelain. But most of them, still not 100%, uh, but they're about uh, 70%, something like that. So I compare, you know, this, uh, uh, Different old porcelain and new one, just like the wine, you know. Yeah, everybody like the wine. You know, you, if you buy some uh, a Chateau Rothschild or Chateau something, you know, you have a new one. It's the same thing from the grape. You know, when you taste it, it's different. Only when you taste it, you know the difference. Same thing like us, we can see, you compare with the two together, then, then you know the difference. And uh, that's why, you know, the, the people chasing by the wisdom of luck, but some of them really doing fine. And it's really, you know, the coming close now. But you know, the old time porcelain always used the nature material, you know, and today they use the chemical. So it's made a difference also, you know, the color come out is not like the, Okay, let's go next. Okay, thank you everybody.